So welcome to Chair Red TV, I'm Ian McNay and today we have in our little studio here in the office we have John Reed, who is our Director of Catalogue. That's right, been hello. been many years now and one of John's briefs is to compile and instigate box sets for which Trey Red has become quite well known and the one we're going to talk about first is your first kind of major box set, Scared to Get Happy. So just tell us where you got the idea from. Um, I think the box sets originally came, I was freelancing them for Cherry Red and I just saw that we owned or represented all these fantastic singles that I bought at the time. Great little records that, that just meant a lot to me when I was at college and that whole 80s indie boom to me hadn't really been properly represented on CD, there have been a couple of compilations here and there. Um, and. Uh, yeah, and, I, and I've done box sets before in, in, in our previous labels and just thought if you can bring all these really cool tracks together, they become more than some of their parts and you kind of collectively define an era. And if you do it right and people see it, they go, that's me. That's, it's almost like it's a personal statement, you touch them. And that's to me the sign of a good compilation of that sort where you you, you just, people just go, it hits them there. You, none of this stuff, it's not, you don't need any of these records. It's not, I have to have that. It's, that touches me. I, need, I want it because it speaks to me. That, that to me is a good compilation. Scared to Get Happy did that for me when I was compiling. I was really excited. What else can we get on there? Yeah. So what is on Scared to Get Happy? What era is it basically? So it's 80s indie pop. And what I love about these box sets is they always evolve. They start in one place and actually end up somewhere else. That was going to be a much narrower remit, three CDs, and it was going to celebrate this little period that they now define as C86, revolving around this enemy cassette that almost unintentionally or inadvertently captured this little boom in indie music that had maybe been spawned by the Smiths and what have you. But, and then we just thought, well, if we expand it to the whole decade, we can tell a story. And I, and I often subtitle these box sets, A Story Of. Because a story, because it's not the story, because there isn't the story of anything. It's everything subjective. Everyone's point of view is different. And also, you're never going to get all the tracks you want. So it becomes a story that collectively, musically tells the story of how something went from A to B, chronologically, or whatever. So, And how do you decide to what put What's it put on there? Very difficult. You, you, you have certain benchmark tracks, certain bands, the, the key, the touchstones, if you like. Uh, you often can't get all the touchstones, but so even from a, from a Cherry Red point of view, I wanted the Marine Girls and, and those kind of early 80s bands. And then you run through Wanted Primal Scream, The Wedding Present, a lot of those C86 groups. And then you kind of roll out and, uh, you know, to try and get the, to get the Stone Roses was amazing in Spiral Carpets because they kind of ended the decade. So you have to license. Um, we obviously, there's certain tracks that Trey Red own or control. Yeah. And you have to license from major companies, independent companies, directly from bands sometimes. So it's quite a process, isn't it? You have to go through yeah. to actually get the rights to all the tracks. And actually, with no disrespect to our friends in the major record companies, it's actually, in some respects, easier to license from bands and small labels because they move more quickly. Yeah. And... So, and it's also quite an interesting process because you, you kind of get to know these people. Facebook and all social media allows us to, to find these people uh, more easily. So do, do you get feedback from outside on what to put on there, suggestions? Yeah, I mean, certainly we're scared to get happy. It was interesting because uh, for whatever reason, um, I put that up on, on Facebook, maybe nine months, 10 months before it came out. And very much, perhaps because that was the first one we did like that, I wanted to get feedback from people, which included some of the band members. And it was fantastic. There was a proper kind of viral, you know, social media response to it and, and a proper online conversation. And so the project evolved as a, res as a result. There were tracks that I'd never heard of, that people sent me links to on YouTube, like, I've got to have that, or my mates in the band. And bands were approaching me saying, can we be on, please? Lloyd Cole... Get, let, licensed his first single, pre-Polydor, which is very obscure, because other bands that he was inspired by, like on the Kitchenware label, Hurrah and Prefab Sprout were on there, and he said, I want to be on there because they're on there. So, so even the artists become fans of the story we're telling, which so is So there really is a whole evolving process here, isn't there? It's not just you, John Reed, sitting down and going through and I want this, this, and this, and this, and hope you get the rights. It's, it's kind of... It, 
it evolves as it goes along and you start Absolutely. with a track listing and it might end up quite different. It, yes, and it's, it's born out of necessity to a degree because rights are spit all over the place. Some record labels won't license, some, some rights no one knows where they are. So you have to improvise and, and obviously we try and use a fair degree of Cherry Red owned rights as well because that's what we do. And so you kind of sift through the catalogue to see what's there as well. And, and it's, the whole thing is, is quite creative and quite fun. But then you have to be disciplined enough to say, look, that's enough, enough's enough, that, that's now, we're, we're there. But that certainly was, it started as a three CD and then became a five CD. Yeah. Um, and I know the Manchester box set, which I'll go on next because you live in Manchester and you love Manchester. Right. This started off, I think, as a lot less. It's ended up as seven CDs, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, I fair And to you say, had to fight, didn't you, to get to be allowed to put seven CDs because well, yeah, it really is quite an epic box set. It is this. an epic box set and, and one of the reasons it grew was because again you start with an idea and, and certainly in independent music there is a kind of narrative arc if I it sounds a bit pretentious but that starts with year zero of punk to a degree and then evolves through post-punk and the indie years through the 80s and you can say to a degree it ends at the end of the 80s, because then a few things happen like Manchester and Shoegaze and it goes into a new era. I mean, it's all subjective, but that, that's how I often see that. And so with the Manchester box, it started as, yeah, okay, you've got punk, you've got Buzzcocks, Year Zero, Spiral Scratch EP. That's so what you started with, yeah. Absolutely, we start with the Buzzcocks that's track. Right. And then I was running through and, and Manchester kind of then rolled through into the early 90s. There were bands that were inspired by the Stone Roses and Happy Mondays. And you think, well, it's not a great leap of faith. You can, go, you can get to Oasis, who do their first sort of demo record that Creation put out at the end of 93. So that's really how that, and suddenly you're stretched because you want to have enough stuff to fill the story between 77 and 93. So you can argue that's too great a, a time span to cover, really. But yeah, we went to seven C CDs and, and it sold well and been well received and all the rest of it. So. So of course you have you have the idea mm. and you have kind of a starting point for tracks. But at the end of the day, it has to sell. Yes. Otherwise, the next one you come up with maybe isn't so well received in terms yeah, of I mean, an idea. Obviously, we're not looking for mass market in the way that I don't know a major record company is. So as long as we get our return, and it's, it's also a great way, of course, of using our underutilized tracks. So we're generating revenue from things that maybe aren't aren't earning us money. But, but the, and the main thing is that, yeah, you, these genres, if you did individual artists, by the, by, you know, obviously we, we can't access, a, we can't do a Stone Roses greatest hits. But if you can get licensed the Stone Roses track and combine it with all the bands who wanted to be the Stone Roses, we can get healthy sales. So we're improvising to create these really cool compilations because it's something we do that's different. And you they know, do, yeah. There's something I got asked the other day, which I thought was an interesting question. It's, they say, did you, do we miss, because at Cherry we're not doing very much new signing of, of unknown bands and trying to develop unknown bands. They said, do you miss not being in A&R in terms of finding these bands that haven't got deals or artists that haven't got deals? And I said, well, actually, A&R wise, we do a lot. We find all these tracks which have come out years and years and years ago, a lot of them are very obscure and we are discovering, with every box set, we are discovering loads more bands that actually first time round didn't get much exposure. Yeah, absolutely. And, and but it's, and it's also is a kind of a, uh, even with the, well certainly with the Manchester box, we work with Manchester uh, Digital Music Archive and, and they reached out to their kind of fan base and lots of people who, who have been involved in the uh, Manchester music scene for years were suggesting tracks, changing tracks. And that's one reason it also expanded because they wanted to see the more obscure groups on there. In fact, some of them were in those bands. So, so there is, yeah, it's a fascinating journey. And, the, and the, other, the other thing that happens is that you, when you start to sequence it, you realize that the power of a compilation is not necessarily in great individual tracks, but this collective impression that you get when you play it through, which I think is always true of a compilation. So, so it's not like it's the, every track's a classic, but it definitely does tell a story. And I find that fascinating as well. Yeah, it's not a classic every track, but it has its value, and yeah. it has its beauty. Of course, then after Manchester, we did Liverpool. That's only five CDs, but that also tells a unique story of the, of the Liverpool scene for many years. Yeah, and that one was compiled by, by one of our consultants uh, who I work with closely, 
And yeah, Liverpool's a smaller city, smaller musical output, but again, very important. Interesting how the Liverpool and Manchester scenes cross-pollinated during that era as well. Uh, in fact, there was even talk at one point of, of one of the Liverpool labels and factory records merging. So that could have told an entirely different story. You could have had this whole Liverpool-Manchester kind of uh, pool of musicians working together. So yeah, that's so like they all tell a story and we're working on a, a Scottish independent one at the moment too which again is Edinburgh, Glasgow and everything else. So where do area. the ideas come from? Do you, do you wake up in the morning and think, I've got a great idea for a new <laughs> compilation? Uh, sometimes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think it is uh, inspired to a degree by, certainly for me, having been a record buyer when I was younger. And you look back to eras that you were part of. So I did a Mod Revival box set because that was an important thing to me in the early 80s and that's done very well. And the 60s projects are because I've always been fascinated by 60s music, but also because, yeah, it's the underbelly, it's the little tracks that you hear from nowhere and think, where on earth did that record come from? Which of course is the whole impetus for record collectors and, and this whole sort of curiosity value of records that were, yeah, completely missed at the time, so. And then we'll just finish off with maybe you talking about this little series you did here, C86. C87, I haven't got C88, but it exists, yeah, and C89. Yeah, so that, again, that spun off, directly spun off um, Scared to Get Happy because that was originally inspired by, by the whole C86 generation of bands. And um, essentially, Neil Taylor, who co-compiled the original C86 cassette, got in touch with me and w w loved Scared to Get Happy. And I said, well, look, why don't we just reimagine C86? and he got involved and helped and we worked on it together and the c86 expanded version which is we added sort of 50 tracks to it was one of our best sellers and and it also struck me that people like these kind of year by year compilations so we do well with the 60 psychedelic ones 67 68 69 and so on and um so that struck me as, as obvious that we would then follow up with c87 and then we did C88 and I was going to leave it there and then didn't and C89 is just about to come out this month and hopefully next year we'll do C90 so we'll just start tackling the, the next decade so yeah. so as long as they work and in, so far as enough people buy them you'll keep going with them yeah and it, it is interesting because you might have a couple of key bands like on C89 you've got uh, the Mock Turtles or you've got Cast the Unstoppable Sex Machine but then you've got untold obscure bands and it's interesting because people understand they might have Sherry Fatman by Carter, but they certainly haven't got singles by the Ammonites or whoever it is, Barbel, right? All these obscure groups. But the, the big groups are the signposts, and then people get past that and then learn all this other music. So, yeah. so if somebody's watching this and they've got an idea for a box set, yeah. they should get in contact with you. Absolutely, right? yes, yeah. yes. And it Drops helps if they've got a track listing as well. Well, maybe, yeah, but the yeah. concept's all. I mean, we've yeah. got so many concepts we're looking to explore in the next couple of years. Um, they are a lot of work, but they're very rewarding, you know, yeah. so yeah. And to give people an idea, we also, you mentioned the psychedelic ones. We've done some punk ones. There's a mod one here somewhere. There's a folk one. Yeah, that's kind of acid folk. And there's another yeah. one here that's folk pop from the 60s. I'm a Freak Baby's like sort of proto-heavy metal. Uh, Night Comes Down is a 60s mod one. This is kind of uh, mop top Beatles style 60s beat music and so on. So, I mean, most of it is British music because it's easier to clear, but we've also sort of dipped our toe in the water of doing American music as well. So, yeah, long may they sail. And it's fun, isn't it? It is fun. Yeah. Great fun, yeah. Good. Thank you very much, John. No problem.